Yes, Thank you, everybody. Um, Ms. Barbeau, I'm going to hand it back over to you. Uh, we're on the Fortis uh, Electric Franchise Fee. Uh, thank you, committee, and my apologies. Uh, so before you is the request from Fortis to advise them of any changes that council would like to make to the franchise fee. Uh, request for the change must be into uh, Fortis by November 1st. So there is uh, is a time frame if we miss the November 1st deadline, there is still the opportunity for changes, but they do not make any uh, promises as to when they will fit it into their work schedule to have done. Not changing the current franchise fee will generate an additional $46,000 to the town's franchise fee revenue based on their distribution revenue forecast, which is used to calculate the revenues. And also with no change to the franchise fee would increase the cost to be paid by the residential customer of about $6.61 per year. And with that, are there any questions? Thank you, Ms. Borbeau. Uh, Councillor McGoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to take the recommended action that committee request administration to bring the report on the Fortis Alberta electric franchise fee to the regular council meeting of October 17th, 2023, with no changes to the 2024 franchise fee rate. Uh, and I see no reason to speak to it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor McGoon. We now have a direction, Councillor Taylor. Yeah, I'm concerned about that because the uh, my my preference for the, the both the gas and the net the gas and the electrical fee is that we cap it. And that we try to get our taxes from uh, property taxes, which I see as, as I've said in the past, as being uh, more visible and uh, better understood by the taxpayer. So, uh, my preference would be that uh, we would direct administration to uh, uh, adjust the rider so that the amount collected per customer stays the same for each of these. And then we slowly de emphasize the franchise fees. Which have gone up since 2011, uh, 226 percent from 500,000 to the current 1.7 million with the two of them uh, together. So they have gone up uh, an incredible amount over over time, such that they represent 15 percent of the uh, the net taxes that we take in, and they used to represent in 2011 five percent. So I just don't think it's the best form of uh, taxation that we have in an app. So I. Uh, that's that's the direction I would prefer. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. Council, any other comments or questions on the direction? Councillor Race. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To administration, could you give some insight into where the one point three million dollars um, goes once collected? Administration. Uh, through to committee, the uh, franchise fees collected from Fortis Alberta go into general revenues and they are used to offset operating costs through the operating budget, predominantly our road services and uh, other services that the community has. Recre recreation is also uh, subsidized through taxation and the franchise fees collected reduce the amount of taxation that we are therefore required to collect from residents and businesses. Thank you, Administration. Councilor Reese? Yeah, just a quick follow up. So, are any of these um, monies used in capital projects that would benefit our citizens? Through the chair to uh, all of committee. The, the monies collected could definitely be allocated to fund capital projects, um, one-time projects, some of them which are capital in nature or larger rehabilitation projects are also uh, shown through the operating budget, which these funds could be used to offset as well. Uh, we look at the, the general whole numbers. Um, to my recollection, uh, in the past, it's never been specified that X amount of franchise revenue is paying for this. But if that is the direction and the will, we could certainly move our budgeting process forward, uh, possibly not for the 2024 budget, but in the future. Thank you, Edmund. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Is Councillor Taylor. Yeah, my, my other 
my other concern is that uh, from from the numbers that I've seen here, um, this council's being pretty good with the increases, keeping the increases to uh, less than uh, mm -hmm. uh, 0.5, about 0.5 of percent so so far with these. Uh, these, if we go ahead with this one for this one for this uh, electric one, that would be uh, about a six percent increase in one year. So we'd be uh, going from the past practice for the last two years of capping it. And then we'd be enjoying, we, we would be joining the ranks maybe of past councils, which have at least once in their term gone for uh, bigger increases. And uh, uh, once again, saying that uh, the franchise fee the collection is a legitimate form of uh, basically taxation. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Shelley. Council, any other further? Councilor McGoo. Just as a point of clarification, we're talking about not changing the franchise fee rate, but that would result in a net increase of uh, funds collected from the community. Now, just, just to clarify though, for myself, I'm actually not opposed to the route that Councillor Taylor has also suggested. For myself, the recommended action is one that I think most of council will support. Um, and it is not in the way of actually increasing the franchise free uh, franchise fee percentile that I simply will not support. So that's why the uh, the recommended action is the one that I put on the table. That being said, if the rest of council has a desire to cap uh, the amount, I certainly would be amenable to that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Lagoon. Councilor Taylor. Yeah, my my maybe I was unclear, but maybe I think you got the gist. My 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 point is that the rider going up and down is so relevant as what the taxpayer has to pay that uh, is important to me at the end of the day, which is that six dollar increase. Just to clarify for myself, when it says six dollars and sixty one cents, is that monthly or yearly? Uh through the committee, that's annually. That's yeah, annually. So it'd be an extra six dollars and sixty one cents for the year. Right. Thank you. Okay. Council, anything further? All right. Then we then shall call the question that committee requests the administration to bring the report on the Fortis Alberta electric franchise fee to the regular council meeting of October 17th, 2023, with no changes to the 2024 franchise fee rate. Please vote now. Councilor Reyes? Are you able to vote? It's not coming up on my screen, but I support this motion. Thank you, Councilor Reyes. So that is carried then four to one with Councilor Taylor against. Council, any other further matters on the Fort Alberta electric franchise fee? Seeing none, then we'll move on to 5.4, the APCO gas franchise fee to, I'm assuming, CEO Panasic, over to Ms. Borbeau. There we go. Thank you, committee. And, and prior to starting the presentation, administration is recommending recommended action from page two that committee direct administration to bring the report on the AFCO gas franchise fee to the regular council meeting on October 17th, 2023, with no changes to the 2024 franchise fee rate. Uh, Franchise fees for ATCO gas were changed in uh, for the 2023 year by council. Uh, it was reduced by 2.6%, which brought it down to a 12%. Uh, as with the uh, former report, we have attached all of the fees throughout the various municipalities in the province of Alberta. And uh, Hinton is on the lower end of all of them. Uh, my apologies, I didn't do an average on those. Uh, the 12% remaining uh, with no changes would bring our revenue to a, I'm thinking it's a slight decrease resulting in revenue of, so a slight decrease uh, from where we were at in 2023, but they're also, they're slightly less um, with retired revenue. So, any questions? Thank you, Ms. Burwell. Council, Councillor Taylor. Yeah, I just have to clarify. Maybe you said it. Um, 
if, if we vote for this, uh, leaving the writer the way it is, which I think is what you're saying, the effect of that on the um, average average customer is a negligible increase, decrease, or uh, just a negligible change. Is that what you just said? Uh, through to committee. So our anticipated revenues for 2023 from ATCO were 422,800. Uh, with leaving the franchise fee rate the same at 12%, our uh, forecast for Hinton would be $385,157. So slightly less because they have reduced the uh, monies available that they calculate the delivery tariff revenue on. Uh, the average fee per customer, I'm sorry, their calculator did not. Um, I mean, it would go down our fees, I'm sorry, in uh, <laughs> their calculator didn't have it. So I do not have what the uh, ATCO gas customers paid in the fees for 2023. But the estimate for 2024 would be $70.25 per year. Okay, I'm still I don't want to clear that. So that I'm I'm sorry, I'm not understanding. So the the average person would pay seventy dollars in two thousand twenty four, and they paid what in two thousand twenty three? Uh, through the committee, that is the the number I don't have in this report. Oh. Uh, through the chair, I, I can't say for certain, but uh, I I would. I would imagine that it would be a negligible amount of two to two to three dollars, uh, based on the thirty-seven, uh, thirty-seven thousand dollar decrease, but likely, likely around three dollars, three dollars more, less, less. That's fine. Thank you. Okay, Council Lagoon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to then put forward option one that can be direct administration and bring the report on the ACO gas franchise scheme to the regular council meeting of October 17th, 2023, with no changes to the 2024 franchise fee rate. Uh, and for myself, this is, I will speak to this simply because it's the other half to that, uh, that overall negligible increase. For this, it's an overall negligible uh, decrease in funds collected. Uh, so for right now, for the time being, I am comfortable leaving both of these the way they are. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Magoon. Council, do you have a direction? Any questions, Councilor Taylor? Yeah, me too, because the rate payer is going to be uh, left with a slight decrease. That's so fine with me. Okay, thank you, Councilor Taylor. Council, any other comments, questions on this direction? Seeing none, I'll call the question then. The committee direct administration to bring the report on the ACO gas franchise fee to the regular council meeting on October 17, 2023. Uh, and it, it also states with no changes to the 2024 franchise fee rate. That's what we have in the recommended options. Ms. David Campbell, if we could capture that, please. Thank you. Councilor Taylor, you have a comment on the motion, your direction? Oh, I'm a little confused. You can't change a rate that hasn't occurred, right? So you, you mean no changes on the 2023 rate? It's not going to change from 2023 to 24? Mm -hmm. Is that what you mean? Because you can't change the 2024 rate because it hasn't occurred. With no changes to the 2024 rate, for instance, fee schedule. Do you understand well, what I'm not, saying? I, I hear you. If I, Yeah, through the chair. So uh, all we're doing here is we're notifying uh, uh, in this case, ADCO, what our preferred rate will be for 2024. So we have to do it uh, prior to I we have to provide the notification, yeah. but we're not actually changing the rates until 2024. But we do need a motion from council to dictate what we would like the 2024 rate to be. Yeah, yeah I understand that. Okay. All right. That's fine. We're good? 
Okay, if we can see that direction, thank you. So I'll call the question again that the committee direct administration of bring the report on natural gas franchise to the regular meeting of council uh, of on October 17, 2023, with no changes to the 2024 rate. Please vote now. And that is carried unanimously. Thank you, Council. Any other further matters on the ACO gas franchise fee? Seeing none, then we will move on to 5.5 .5, Drupa Evergreens Catholic School Board to uh, CEO Panasic. Thank you, Chair. So under section 670 of the NPA, uh, all municipalities and school divisions now have the responsibility to enter into a joint use planning agreement prior to June 2024. Uh, the town of Hinton has two school divisions within our borders, being the Evergreen Catholic School Division and the Grand Yellowhead Public School Division. Uh, this was brought forward for some initial direction back in March with uh, two motions coming from it being uh, looking at option of increasing usage uh, for the school facilities and to expand the extended use for food and fashion study areas. So both of those have been included in the uh, in the draft Jupa agreement. The main changes that are being put forward is uh, set minimums for weekend and weekday use for the school facilities so that 50 hours for the weekend and 30 for weekdays. Again, those are only intended to be minimums. Uh, an established list of municipal and school facilities and times available for those joint use and new operating guidelines to ensure the community use of the school facilities are accessible to the public uh, and set processes and responsibilities related to acquiring and servicing future school sites. Um, the only thing I'll add is there's there's going to be, what's being proposed will provide some changes to the community and the uh, how that actually looks for groups booking these. So what's being proposed is a little bit different than our processes have been in the past where we would be just the facilitator as a town and wouldn't really engage in anything other than trying to book uh, whatever group would like to be booked for, say, a gymnasium. Um, but when a group did come to us, we would require them to have point people. We would require them to go out and organize themselves. We would require them to uh, get their own insurance. Um, what we're providing here is a little bit different in saying that we as a municipality already have the necessary insurance. We already have the necessary paperwork in place through this agreement. Um, and then we don't, and then by facilitating it through the municipality, we're not so exclusionary to just people who are involved in individual groups. That gives us a better handle on trying to advertise the public at large on what uh, what recreation opportunities are available and when, where before it was only for, I would say, a, an organized club. Um, uh, and you'd have to almost know somebody to find out when badminton is happening in the community. But this would just give us a little bit more of a handle on actually advertising it to the community, ensuring people know what's available to them and facilitate more use through those minimums. Um, with the Evergreen uh, School Division for uh, quite some time, we haven't had any use uh, at all in these facilities. So this this uh, agreement would ensure that we do have um, some equity within our arrangement with the Evergreen School Foundation. Uh, there are, I would say, very negligible cost implications, and that would only be for additional services that we would like to request. Um, things like if uh, we wanted to use the gym during the summer, for example, uh, there may be some additional custodial fees that would be associated. But I think our our intent is that we would incur very negligible fees on our side. Uh, there are some fees that could be charged uh, from the school, being additional instructors, uh, you know, uh, use of special equipment and those types of things. But the intent of the entire agreement is that um, for the most part, no money changes hands unless the other party is requesting some extras. So, um, 
that's everything I have uh, specific to this, but if there are any questions at the end, happy to answer. Thank you, CEO Panasic. Council, Council Magoo? I think I know the answer to this, but I'll just, I'll clarify anyway. Uh, the uh, ECSRD, my understanding is that they have not yet voted on this joint use agreement, correct? Uh, through the chair, uh, I believe that is correct. Um, uh, the uh, the Evergreen School Foundation or school division and and I broke uh, broke away from uh, discussions on this. I think a week or two ago. I haven't heard word that they've approved this agreement yet. Okay. So if I may, Mr. Chair, mm -hmm. uh, for really for council to know, um, because I was not able to participate due to my employer in the previous joint use agreement. Uh, I reached out to the chair of ECSRD today just to sort of get his take on things and where they stand. Uh, he had informed me that his intention is to start uh, speaking tomorrow with their director of facilities. Uh, the other group that I'm going to reach out to uh, starting tomorrow is the administrators of uh, ECSRD schools. Uh, because again, as an educator, and I shared this with council, for those of you who reached out to me previously, I have some huge concerns, uh, specifically around page 22 of 32 on the uh, the agreement itself. Um, and I'll get I'll get into that in a moment. Um, well, I'll just, sorry, I, I will address it now because I plan on supporting the recommended action to see that it goes through to a regular council potentially. Um, but specifically, if you have any experience in an educational institution, specifically a school, whether it be high school or an elementary school. Um, the following areas may be available through special requests, classrooms, science, computer labs, home ec, fashion studies labs. If I could sort of highlight an example, but it's not the only one. For those of you who ever had moms with sewing machines, I would ask you, how many of your moms said, yeah, it's okay, go touch my sewing machine. Hmm. Or if that was treated like a completely off limit sort of area, and the reason for that is you're dealing with a potentially an expensive piece of equipment. It's finicky. Each one is unique. They have their own ins and outs. Uh, and what we've essentially said to the school is, we think we as a community should have access to that fashion study lab. But again, I put it to you, if you're going to make that room available by way of a joint use agreement, and you're going to have community members in there, potentially messing with delicate equipment, uh, that then potentially has the impact of affecting student learning the next day, I have a huge issue with that. Uh, and I was not given the avenue to sort of voice those concerns, or I reached out and I voiced those concerns one-on-one -on -one prior to having been excluded from the last joint use agreement. That's my intention moving forward tomorrow when I reach out to community members. Uh, and it's sort of, there's, there's more than that, but that highlights a number of them. You have to remember, these are learning environments. These are places where our kids go to learn specifically, they're not just a rec room for people to go and use because it's there. Uh, otherwise I would say, well, that's fine. Then let's open up the Zamboni. Let's open up the offices of administration because they have computers. You know, these, these are people's work environments and learning environments. So again, I have huge concerns. I'll support it moving forward to regular council if that's the will of council, uh, but I can't guarantee I'll support it at regular chambers. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Magoon. Council? Councilor Taylor? Isn't that part of the process? They'll look at the agreement. They might uh, ax out or change a few things, and then it comes back to us. Uh, through the chair to members of council, yes, they certainly can. Um, uh, the one thing that I'll, I'll just mention on that is, you know, I, and I totally understand uh, Councilor Magoon's concerns about uh, opening up uh, further facilities in there. We included that through special requests just because it would have to be either, uh, well, it'd be internal, but my assumption was that it'd be either A, the principal, or B, the teacher specific to that classroom to come up with an arrangement that they could be comfortable with, but it wasn't regularly available to anybody. Uh, and if it was to be requested, it would have to be looked at by the uh, based on the individual merits of whatever uh, whatever may be coming forward through the, uh, the community. Thank you, CEO. Councillor Stashik. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, that was my comment, actually. That the point 
the point says the following areas may be made available. I think may is the important word there. So the, the clarification from CEO Vanasek that, that the uh, decider of whether they may or may not be provided is left to the school. So those, those delicate pieces of equipment, those specialized areas, if the school feels that the risk isn't worth the benefit to the community, they can, they can simply say no. Uh, that was my understanding of it, and I appreciate the clarification from CEO Panasic. Um, looking forward to supporting this as it moves towards right here. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Statue. Councillor Taylor. Another yeah. quick question. You you made this up by talking to your uh, counterpart over there, correct? That's they, correct. They saw it too, so they, they know what's coming. Okay, that's correct. So they had a chance to already provide feedback. <laughs> That's correct. And I'll, and just for some clarification, the uh, the individual that I'm working with is a, a division director and isn't necessarily uh, involved in any one school. So I, I think that's where the concerns may came from is in the individual schools. But from a director's standpoint for working for the division, he, he didn't have a, an issue with this one, with those particular clauses. Okay, thank you. Too. Just a, another quick question. Why is the Gerard Redmond field not included on page 20 to 21 of our facilities? Um, is, that, is that an omission or is there a reason? Like I see that we include the St. Gregory soccer field, but I see nothing for the Gerard Redmond uh, field. Presumably they've got a field. Is that our field? That's their field? That's why it's not included? Uh, through the chair. Me. To the chair of the rest of council, I believe that is our facility. It's a town and local facility. Redmond. The grounds look like school grounds, but they're actually town park. So the question stands then. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, through the uh, through the chair, I, I can certainly look into that. Um, my assumption had this point would be that we likely have an agreement for them to use that at all times because it is attached to the school and that is for school use primarily. Um, but I'll, I'll double check into the reason that we omitted that particular field. And, and which field? Uh, can you repeat that, Councilor Taylor? Uh, Gerard Redmond one. Thank you. Okay. Council? Any other further questions or direction? The recommended one, two options, referring to regular or refer back to the joint use planning agreement. You. I think I'm okay with the uh, uh, the account. I'd like to put a motion forward that number one, we refer the joint use planning agreement to the next regular council meeting as presented. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. Council, any comments? Would you like to speak to it, Councillor Taylor, or anyone else? No. Okay. I'll speak to it. Um, I think this is, I mean, the fact that we haven't had an agreement for a long time with this this school division, um, you know, it'd be interesting, again, from the perspective and, and learning others that I share maybe, you know, now the Council of Laguna shared some uh, uh, possibilities, but the fact that it can be may uh, be uh, uh, not used, uh, it'll be the discretion of the school. So I'll be in favor of this. I think the biggest thing that for me is the physical activity component. I think that uh, that's the biggest part is using the gymnasiums for for some of our organizations that uh, require that that uh, space. So this would increase that for them. So thank you, Councilor Magoon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm supportive of this uh, this direction in that it will simply move the joint use agreement to a regular council meeting. Uh, for myself. Just to build off of what the CAO had mentioned, to have high-level discussions with the director of facilities is one thing. I think a real question for me that I need to know more about 
is to what extent administrations in the specific schools and teachers uh, are sort of aware of what sort of impact that this might have on their spaces. So I'd like to get their input. Uh, and that's something I'll we'll see if we can help come to this in advance of this meeting. Thank you. Okay. All right, seeing no other, anyone in the queue, then I'll call to question. The committee refers the joint use planning agreement to the next regular council meeting as presented. Please vote now. And that is carried unanimously. Thank you, council. <laughs> Councilor Taylor. Um, what about the uh, what about the public uh, system agreement? Is that already uh, a done deal, or is that coming back to us separately? Uh, you know, Sarah, as a council, that will be coming back separately. We do have. Uh, a joint use agreement, but we have a we don't have a joint use agree agreement that would satisfy all of the different elements to the NGA. So uh, this one was taken on first just because it was seen as the larger of the two. Uh, whereas uh, for the public school division, the general view, at least of mine, is that it would be a much simpler agreement. We've had a, a long lasting relationship on joint use of the facilities, which is frankly the the more difficult. Uh, part so uh, once this is complete with the evergreen or the ever, evergreen Catholic school division will be working with the public school to bring it forward prior to June of 24. Thank you. Thank you, administration. Thank you, through the chair of the rest of the uh, response to the question earlier about uh, the field at Gerard Redmond School. It is listed in the inventory. Oh. It's uh, it's camouflaged as lean. Maline Courts and Park at 190 Maline Drive, Hinton, Alberta. It's just got a list there. It's a soccer field, long jump, ball down, et cetera. It's all there. Congratulations, that's well camouflaged. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Duke, for clarifying that. Sorry about that, everyone. All right, no. Uh, anything else in regards to the JUPA agreement matter? Seeing none, then we're going to move on to 5.6 or review for the Hinton Rural Renewal Screen Program. Councilor Stashik. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my business is a uh, registered member, of, a reg registered employee, employer, sorry, with the Hinton Rural, Hinton Rural Renewal Screen Program. Uh, and as such, it presents a potential pecuniary interest for me. So I'm going to recuse myself in this discussion. Okay, thank you. So I will just uh, move to Council Chambers and as we to move on to the next uh, agenda item, if somebody could get me, I'll let you know. All right, sounds thank good. You. Thank you, Councillor Stasha. If we can note that, please, in the minutes. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Go to sleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Council. So we're gonna yeah turn this over to CEO Panasic and and transition. I don't turn over the Mr. Thank you. Through the chair, the rest of the committee, this item is to provide an overview of the Hinton. Rural Renewal Stream Program that Council directed administration to undertake approximately one year ago. The report provides a link to the presentation that Council uh, originally received on the municipality's possible role in the Alberta Advantage Immigration Program, or AAIP, as well as additional background information on everything that's occurred since, well, almost everything that's occurred since administration was given direction. Uh, this includes forming an ad hoc support committee suggested by the provincial presenter, designing the application processes and the numerous forms and templates for maximum efficiency and for safeguarding program participants, standing up a web page, and liaising with the province, other municipalities, businesses, and candidates on program experiences. As mentioned, the focus of the program is to support Hinton's businesses retain newcomers in the community, and minimize the cost of the program to the town as well. Hinton's program criteria processes have been adjusted a number of times, primarily stock problems that emerged from time to time, and to increase efficiencies wherever possible. At this time, uh, for 2024, administration is designing more 
eligibility requirements to ensure criteria different, I should say, not more, to ensure that the program supports business needs expected in Hinton and over the short term, for example, through 2024. To date, 50 employers in Hinton have been approved and they permanently filled approximately 100 jobs with candidates hoping to make it through the AAIP and gain permanent residency in Hinton. Just today, five or so new endorsement letters were issued. There are six attachments to the reports, mostly reference documentation around the program. And administration is recommending that this item be considered as information. Thank you, Ms. Duke. Council, questions on this overview stream program from mm -hmm. administration? Council McGoon? Just as a high level starting point, uh, if I could get clarification, a recommended action to accept the report doesn't negate council from taking any further additional actions as we become more familiarized with what's going on currently with the program, what the impacts of the community are, so on and so forth. If, if I may. Through the chair, no. If, if we want to review this or look at uh, uh, changes or anything else in the future, we certainly can. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Councilor Taylor? Yeah, um, the concern I have, and I've talked to like uh, at least five people who are part of the program, and they all say that the program is a, an absolute an absolute uh, blessing, that it's a good program to have to attract, um, well, all of them except for one, but four out of five say that it's really something good that we have. And I think we can evidence that in the large number of people that we have. But where, where in the comments that I get back that we run into, that I run into a concern was kind of what you were alluding to. And that's when it comes to the employers who have uh, either a larger number of workers that they need or specialized uh, workers that they're trying to bring. And that's where these 15 parameters that are on page 80 uh, seem to be problematic for those type of employers. So situation I envision or they, the people have told me about is what happens when uh, Bond day comes and they're going to spend their uh, large amount of money renovating the uh, pulp mill and they're going to hire like 100 or 50 uh, uh, fire watch workers at $25, $30 an hour, then that's going to strip uh, employees from some of these uh, businesses and we're going to have to have some flexibility there, especially for businesses that need large number of employees. So, you know, like some of these I, I think are problematic for that category you know, like 8, 10, 11, 12, and 15 are problematic for that. So my preference would be to uh, either uh, maybe make a motion or ask uh, administration about the feasibility of uh, developing a second category. So the categories that we have right here seem to be okay for the average type of uh, employee we're getting, which are the... Um, how do you say it? Low skilled employees that are coming for most of these jobs, they fit this, and these requirements seem to be okay. But where we get the second category, which is a specialized where the employer needs a larger number of employees, some of these don't fit that well. So, can we develop a second category of, uh, of uh, uh, a second category here, I guess, of employer applicant and parameters for it? or that specialized workers and somebody who needs a, a larger number of workers as well. And then that would be done on a, as you were saying in this thing, uh, you've kind of tried to work it into the existing parameters. Uh, that would be an exemption proposal. So if you need more, a certain set of circumstances, and you're, you're one of the second category, as opposed to the run of a male guy who just needs one or two, which seems to be most of them, then you could put a proposal in and we could be prepared to modify, you know, up to maybe three or four of these categories to meet your needs. Do you need a motion to do that or, are you, or is that the way you're heading anyways? Because you've kind of tried to do it with these parameters right here, but to me, it's almost mixing parameters for the run of the mill of people that are just uh, doing this, um, you know, the unskilled people. And then it almost needs to be a separate statement for the second category of people. That's the way I kind of see it based on what I've talked to people about. Administration, any yes. comment? Through uh, the chair to the rest of the committee, to, to do address your the, the root of your concern, which I think you're, what you're stating is that there appears to be uh, a requirement so far that the program has served unskilled worker 
recruitment quite well. Mm -hmm. and, and I would have to agree that that has certainly been the case, that those are the applicants that we've been seeing uh, primarily. And we are working now, The one of the best parts of the program is its agility and its ability to adapt itself to whatever emerges out of the um, business community and the candidate's experience. And so, yes, you're exactly right that uh, items number 11 and 12, sorry, 12 in particular, in the candidate requirements are, are an attempt to uh, develop that different category and to make sure, I mean, currently right now, um, the program is happy to uh, consider uh, requests for um, exemptions, but I think it's time to start looking at those skilled uh, jobs and requ job requirements and make sure that the employees that have those matching qualifications wherever they are, are available to hint at employers. Yeah, and then the other one that came up as well from the experience was that student visas, uh, people that may be in Hinton in 2024 on student visas will also need to be considered for um, for uh, endorsement if the employer is unable to fill the position in with a Canadian and they want to hire a student that's about to graduate mm -hmm. because that is not a work permit and currently the requirement is work permit. Yeah. Okay. Follow up. Sure. I think it's more than specialized. It's the people that might all of a sudden need a large number of uh, of uh, people because uh, we, we could have uh, Monday come here and start. I'm not going to list names, but come here, uh, development come here and take away a large number of these workers you know, because they're paying a lot more. And then somebody all of a sudden is left short. So, um, so that to me would fit into that second category. And a number of these people have said they don't even mind paying a fee of uh, like Jasper pays a fee, so they don't mind paying a two hundred fifty dollar fee if we need to hire administrative people or something like that to help uh, support the program. So would you see that that category would also fit into this this the specialized? Uh... Yeah, through the chairs mm -hmm. of the rest of the committee. So I think that there is already currently we have a three um, candidate per employer limit, uh, only because there's volume concerns primarily uh, but we also want to make sure that uh, employers are doing their due diligence and trying to hire people that are already in Hinton for example or including Canadians obviously but certainly there is cases where a larger number of employees might be needed and the exemption would be addressed already we would, we would certainly consider a request for exemptions um, as so long as the rest of the program parameters are adhered to because we have to answer the Alberta Advantage Immigration Program to to certify that we are checking that they are trying to hire uh, Canadians, and that um, for, and another example is that, that the address of the candidates is unchanged. So Alberta Advantage Immigration Program is checking up on our letters that were so we have to be diligent in how we um, continue to process those. But a number of, just because someone has a, a need for ten employees or something like that, that they can't fill with Canadian candidates, you know, that's something that our program needs to consider. And those, those will probably emerge in the next year. Okay, last one more follow-up? One more follow-up. Yep. Uh, then I don't stop for a while. Yeah, I'm only talking about uh, the parameters here that say Town of Hinton. I'm not talking about the AAIP. All the parameters I've mentioned are Town of Hinton parameters. So of course we have to follow the AAIP. But parameters 8, 10, 11, 12, and 15, which seem to be problematic to this category of employee, aren't AAIP parameters, they're town of parameters. So they should be something we can modify into a bigger proposal mm -hmm. in order to accommodate uh, uh, this need that looks like it's coming downstream. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McGoon. Yes. I, I think my question is for administration, but potentially council too. I, I want to start by saying thanks to those counselors who sort of brought brought this to my attention. They had said, yeah, you know, I've had some sidebars with businesses and these are some of the, you know, concerns that have been shared with us because that's what's first alerted me to the fact that there, there were some community concerns um, <clears throat> revolving around this. And I guess my question for administration and council is, have have we given businesses who are interested in this program or are part of this program a chance to give us feedback on like as a as a community organization to receive feedback on you know are there any roadblocks to our our current requirement set or are there things that could streamline this program 
that would make it easier for you? Have, have we created that avenue or that forum? Because if not, then maybe that's something council could direct. And I apologize, this is an area where I'm really trying to get up to speed on, I think. Okay, administration. Yeah, great question, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so the committee that I alluded to is a community committee, quite ad hoc. Uh, one of the members on that is an industry representative. Uh, and we actually have two seats, I believe, allocated to industry. We haven't filled the, the other one yet. Um, and uh, we have been receiving feedback and adjusting the program as we go along. There's been no problem from the current approved employers with the parameters that we've set. We've all been quite happy to meet those, no problems. Uh, what's coming is differences in the next year, we think. We'd like to adjust for that. But we are also having a social mixer, or I should say a business networking mixer this Thursday morning here at the town hall or at the town hall in the lobby. And then we'll use the committee room a little bit just to provide them with an opportunity for exactly that. And then we'll just garner feedback, uh, anonymous and non-anonymous feedback, whatever they want to give us. And that's the more formal. And then we're doing the same thing with candidates on a social evening mixer to try and get, make sure that they're getting supported. And they're feeling welcome in Hinton. What else can anybody do to offer them extra services uh, and any feedback that they have on the process? Exactly that. So, good. Uh, yeah, that helps a lot. Thank you. Uh, and I appreciate that. It's a valuable procedure, I'm sure. So, I myself and Q, um, it was pointed out, and actually, this is something that I think all organizations, it doesn't necessarily in regards to foreign workers, but the concern is they come through this program get the requirement residence applications and then they're gone. Um, and I I get it. We see this in a lot of industries. People come to northern communities or different smaller communities, get their get their toehold into it and then they move on to larger centers. I'm I'm only assuming, but is there anything that could other than attracting and hints and being attractable to them to stay is there anything that is a barrier to that happening, potentially? Yeah, thank you for the question to the chair of the rest of the committee. So that is one of the main features, and it was part of the presentation that the council originally received is retention you have to work on. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it, it's always a struggle with rural uh, Alberta to do economic development and community development that sticks and stays and, and starts to ramp up and build on itself. I think we'll find out over a period of time. We're doing everything we can, as we said, to ensure that they don't feel very welcome, including things like the programs like Hello Hinton and connecting um, our candidates to all the services in town and including like in-person contacts. So I, I don't have an answer for you yet. I'm really hoping that they stay. I have seen community development through immigration and in other communities. Not everybody stays, but some will stay. I, I'm confident that some will stay and that that will ramp up. And I'm hoping that a community gets built. Our multiculturalism will be enhanced. For example, another thing. Excellent. If I may, I, I appreciate it. You know, it, it's not an easy answer. I get that. And how, how do you keep people in our community? But I think it's important that we, it, it, I mean, it's not, it's nothing against the program itself. It's just the nature of the business that sometimes, you know, they have other other hopes and dreams. And well, you know, like you said, we have to make this a, a, an appealing place to stay in. So thank you. Uh, Council, any other question for administration on this program? Councilor Taylor? Oh, no, sorry. So no, just, sorry. No, I did have a comment. Yep, okay. I just want to I just want to go off what you said. There have been some people in town that have been uh, talking about this program and some negative aspects to this program um, about things that have been uh, happening. But but those things uh, seem to me to be those things are unsubstantiated. And by and far, by far, the impression that I get by talking to people that are actually involved in the program is that the good that the po program uh, causes uh, is. Uh, is far outseeds uh, any negative aspects to the program, especially things that are uh, not substantiated or unproven. So uh, that's, and these people use words like uh, absolute blessing, awesome, don't change this. Uh, we're getting a benefit from them and uh, it should continue. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor. Council McGoon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to take the recommended action that committee accepts the report on the Hinton Rural Renewal Stream Program as information. Excellent. Thank you, Councillor Magoon. 
I, and you know what? I will take one last plug at it. I think um, administration has indicated that there are some upcoming events for members and non-members to participate in that feedback. And that's important. You know, if we're going to make anything that we do bigger and better uh, or more comprehensive, you know, please give us the, give us your feedback so we can take that into consideration and move forward. That's important. So. Thank you. Councillor Taylor? Yeah, and I'll vote for that as opposed to making a specific uh, motion to develop a second category like I talked about because you've indicated that you're basically uh, heading along those lines already. So I think we're covered there. Thank you very much. And I think on that note, to build up that for the, the community to also know the flexibility of this program, it's adaptable. You know, it's we're not stuck in one form and, and we're growing and building as the program develops and builds out. We learn more things then the committee can make their recommendations. And I do encourage that there's two spots, you know, for other industries to get involved, uh, you know, and, and give their input. And the more people, the better, and get a better look at it. So, Mr. Chair. Councilor Race. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I too will support this motion. And to add, I just want to thank FCSS. I've um, heard some wonderful comments on the work that they're doing with this program. So thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Rousseau, I saw your hand. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair, to the rest of the committee. I, I will say this, that, uh, you know, my colleague uh, on my left-hand side here and I have talked to the government quite a bit. We've been involved. We brought this program here to the town based on the application, and it was fitting for community services then to run with it from there. We haven't had much guidance from the province mm -hmm. in terms of how to execute this. So I think we need to, to give ourselves a pat on the back to know that we've navigated this. The parameters that may seem tight right now has been there for a reason. However, with industry input, we've seen that we can actually, you know, navigate through this so that we can have this category as constantly mm -hmm. as it's indicated that will help us to get the needed talent. And then back to Councillor Hans's point in terms of um, how do we retain these people? I think that's a job of all of us, mm -hmm. from councillors to administration to business owners, that we make these folks welcome. Mm -hmm. The owners is on the, of course, the employers to ensure that they have good culture and people will stay. And, and as we promote Hinton in a positive way, that people will want to come to Hinton and remain. We will see a loss of, say, talent coming into our town, say, after a couple of months or years, that's natural. But if somebody said it to me from the government recently that we don't lose those people, our first all stands to benefit from those great people. So I, I just wanted to add that, but we're on the right track, and we have made some amendments. I was fortunate to be invited to the meeting, and we provided our input, and I think in the next six to ten weeks, we'll see some categories helping us to be successful in very specific areas. Thank you, Mr. Russo. Council, we have a direction called the question now. The committee accepts the report on the Hinton Rural Renewal Stream Program as information. Please vote now. Mr. Taylor. Look, are we invited to this meeting where all the industry people are coming? Uh, thank you. Through there. Chair of the rest of the committee, absolutely. I uh, will make sure that you get an invitation in your calendars uh, for, for Thursday morning. Unfortunately, I have to be absent, but I will dial in to have a few words anyway, and and it's breakfast, so oh, yeah. 7, 7.30 a.m. It's going to feed me, I'll be there for sure. <laughs> it's breakfast, it's the grind breakfast. Yeah, yeah. It's old now, that's it. <laughs> and just to capture that last direction was carried unanimously. So. Okay, hey, Councilor William, do you mind? Uh, uh, not at all. For, um, There's my note. Councilor Stasher. Oh, as we wait for Councillor Tashik to join us, we'll be moving into our reports. Well, it's all we reuse the paper. Part of my keep the environment green program. For of course, you're done. You can use all the paper you want. On the internet. Okay, Councillor Tashik has joined us, so thank you. Um, we're going to move on to reporting. And we will start with uh, Council Rakes. Council reports. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Nothing to report. Okay. Uh, Councilor Magoon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Nothing to report. 
And Councillor Stashik. And Mr. Chair, I also have that order. And uh, Councillor Taylor. Oh, I'm sure the community is very pleased that the swimming pool is open now. Mm -hmm. I know, I know a number of people who are just a bit cold this morning. Uh, Other than that, I have nothing to report. All right, thank you. I'm not sure that was something, but okay. <laughs> um, and for myself, uh, I have nothing to report at this time. So moving on then to Chief Administrative Officer reporting and status report, uh, Seal Knasik. Uh, thank you, Chair. I have included a uh, the uh, September status and operating report. And if there's any questions on that, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you. Uh, Council, do you have that report? Any questions of the highlights from seeing Open Asic? Councilor Taylor? I see, I see we, we've got the, the wee bit um, in here. So is there a plan to incorporate the wee bit in programming? Uh, <clears throat> through the chair, the uh, we did or web web it. whatever, <laughs> whatever it's called, uh, it, it has been incorporated into the program to my knowledge, so it is on a, a regularly scheduled basis. I don't know what exactly that is, but um, just Jupiter, possibly. So, I don't have anything more to add in detail, but the uh, Alberta Day about Alberta Splash and Smile on September 3rd was its inaugural use. So all of the safe work procedures and all the training needed for utilizing it fully in the pool are in place. And that was took a little while, but now with the pool reopened today, I think you'll see some programming with it. Yeah, looking forward. Okay. Anyone else, any questions? Councilor Taylor? Yeah, I look at interest at the ATE August stats and uh, that's 931 tickets. We can maintain that for the year. And those are like, me $150 a ticket. That's like over a million and a half dollars just from the uh, photo radar program. Do we have any uh, safety statistics in the way of uh, reduced accidents to support such a large uh, program? Through the chair to uh, public committee. Um, yes, we do an assessment of all the uh, active zones you know, on an annual basis to the staff sergeant and myself and improve those locations and, and they're approved based on uh, safety, uh, safety requirements, uh, uh, history of uh, offenses, mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and then they're approved on an annual basis. Um, it, we need to keep in mind that if we calculate those numbers at this $150 a ticket site, uh, which is probably a good number to associate. Uh, we only receive 20% of that as a town. Uh -huh. We don't receive 100%. So 60% uh, goes to the Crown, 20% uh, goes to the operator, and 20% goes to the town. Um, well, yeah, follow up. Yeah, so to me, a compelling justification for continuing with such a large program is the safety statistics with near misses and accidents. Um, that so we'll, we could see some of those numbers um, when we uh, when it's going, it's going to come to us soon. For uh, so that 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 would be uh, to me very valuable to see. Thank you. So if I want to uh, to build off of that, though, you know. Safety is one thing in near mid, but 20 kilometers an hour is a significant speed increase that increases the uh, possibilities uh, of those accidents. And those are in areas of, of intersections and things like that. So, you know, I mean, in my mind, you know, it, it, we are only taking 20%, but 20 kilometers an hour definitely is, is, in my opinion, an excessive amount of speed in these areas that could cause it. So even though accidents may have not have happened, they're only a matter of time to happen. So, you know, that's where I'll leave that at. So, uh, council, any other questions for CEO's report? If not, then I would look for a motion or direction to move into closed session with a second minute break. Councilor Magoon? So moved. Council, you can see that on the screen. 
And we'll call the question of council moving to closed session at 6 27 p.m. Please vote now. I have to vote verbally, yes. All right, and that is here unanimously. Thank you, Councilor Reese. Thank you, everybody. And we'll hike a seven minute break and then we'll get set up for close.